Hello everybody, we are a little bit over halfway through December at this point, and uh, the weather has taken a very wintry turn over the last couple of days, and it's looking like it's going to stay that way through the new year. So today I think we're going to do something a little bit different, and I'm going to go out and look for salamanders, but the primary objective of this video is going to be to give you guys a little bit of insight into what's going through my mind when I'm looking for salamanders, and how you can do the same thing effectively and safely. It's in the mid-50s today, or at least it's supposed to get to the mid-50s. It's not quite there yet. Yeah, this might end up being the last actual vlog of the 2022 season, unless something drastic changes with the weather. So the first thing we're going to do before we hit the field is we're going to sanitize the underside of my boots and just make sure that there is no potential pathogens hanging out on my boots that I'm going to end up dragging wherever I go today. And this holds especially true if we're going to areas that we know a lot of people don't frequent because there's less of a chance that these pathogens are already in that environment. There's a super healthy amphibian population and we want to keep it that way. So this is just a 5% solution of bleach. This is generally the easiest thing that most people use. The only issue with using bleach is it does expire. Let's get out in the habitat and see what we can turn up. It's not a salamander, but it's our first herp of the day, and surprisingly, it's actually a reptile. Nice little green and all. This guy is very, very dark. This is one of several species of reptile that we have that is known to actually change its color in response to its environment. Not necessarily as a form of camouflage, but more for thermoregulation purposes. When it's a lot warmer, the knolls will be green, and when it's a lot cooler like this, they will be dark always look for things to flip that aren't necessarily logs. For whatever reason, artificial cover works fantastically well for salamanders as well as snakes. And this is part of why I like looking for salamanders so much and why I wanted to make this video. They are a great gateway into herping in general because they can be so easy to find. This place I'm at today is a really small nature preserve in a very suburban part of metro atlanta there's a lot of houses surrounding this place on all sides so this is just like a little patch of preserved habitat similar to what a lot of people watching this video might be able to find within a few minutes of their house and the reason i mention that is because a lot of people might think that they live in an area that's too developed for salamanders when at the end of the day they're actually a lot more resilient than most people might think so i'm at this small park and there's a little restroom building here and behind the restroom building there's a tarp here, which I flipped and didn't see anything. And then next to it is this thing. And underneath this, which is like, a, this is like a gutter drain, like the type of thing that would be below a gutter in front of most people's houses. And underneath it, well, there was, oh, he's still there. <laughs> Just couldn't see him. There's our first salamander of the day. Come here, dude. Look at that. This is a marbled salamander and the main species that I think we're probably going to be seeing a lot of today. They're very common here and they're a great introductory salamander if you live anywhere in the southeast. So yeah, flip everything, look for things that aren't necessarily natural cover because for whatever reason, salamanders like it just as much as they do things like logs and rocks. I'm going to very briefly pull this guy out and we're going to put him back. You can see he's kind of going into a defensive posture. This can be a good transition into my next tip, tip number three. Minimize how much you handle salamanders. I get a lot of people saying that like I'm killing them by touching them without wearing gloves, which is definitely not true. There's a lot of misinformation about salamanders out there. But yes, they are very sensitive, especially compared to snakes. So we don't wanna spend a lot of time with prolonged physical contact. So anytime you see me handling salamanders on the channel, I have clean hands. That's another thing you wanna make sure you have clean hands and you wanna minimize how much time you have physical contact with the salamanders. It's very easy for them to absorb bad chemicals through their skin that might be on our hands. So minimize contact and make sure you have clean hands when you're handling salamanders. What this guy's doing here is actually a defensive posture and these guys are capable of sliming just as bad if not worse than slimy salamanders when they do this. So. If you pick a marbled salamander up for even more than a few seconds and it just happens to be a grumpy one, they will give you a very good sliming. So we're going to very gently pick this guy up and let him crawl back under his piece. Go on. You see, they're always eager to go. You can see what's going on there on my thumb is the, uh, the slime that the marbled salamander excreted just in that very brief moment I was handling him. So tip number four is another important one in terms of finding success while looking for salamanders. 
they are definitely not the same as reptiles when it comes to their preferred weather. And if you'll notice, it looks a little damp out here. The leaves are dark and moist. That's because it rained a lot last night. I prefer to look for salamanders after rain events. It raises the water table and brings the subterranean ones closer to the surface. It makes them a little bit easier to find from my experience, not to mention it triggers breeding activity. And generally breeding season is the best time to see any given species of salamander because it's when they're the most surface active. Another important factor to consider when looking for salamanders is the temperature. You don't want it to be hot, but you also don't want it to be freezing cold. I usually say that temperatures between 45 and 65 degrees are pretty optimal. And that is Fahrenheit, so you can see the underside of this log is super saturated, super moist from all that rain we had last night. And sure enough, there is our second marbled salamander of the outing. And once again, this log isn't really anywhere near water, so whenever you have a big rain event, it kind of expands the area in which you can find salamanders because everything is suitably moist, and that really is the limiting factor for these guys since they're amphibians. So this is the log the marbled was under. And the next log over is our next species of the day. That is a southern redback salamander. A very dull one, but a redback nonetheless. And next to him is a green anole. Another thing, if you're seeing lots of fresh mushrooms like this one, it's probably a good day to be looking for salamanders because it means there is plenty of moisture in the area. So two more herps for the day. Hopefully we'll find a more colorful one at some point today, but I'm just gonna let him go back under his log. And that's gonna be tip number five. Always make sure you're letting the things you're finding go right back where you found them and replacing the cover perfectly. Also, here's this guy. We'll put him back under there too. There you go. Now, so far, we've just kind of been flipping random logs in the woods, which can produce salamanders in most places, but there's definitely a finer art to it, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So this microhabitat we're in now is Creekside. It's decent salamander habitat, at least here, and this is also all going to depend on where you're at. So this is most relevant to people who are in the southeast, but generally speaking, it's relevant to most people who want to find salamanders. So this kind of shows you what I mean. Creek's right there. This is a fairly busy trail right here. And this log right next to the trail had a marbled salamander under it. So if you're in an area that just has a ton of salamanders, you can find them basically just by turning anything over. Places like this are special where you can just find tons of salamanders under everything. This is one of very few places like that that I know about within an hour of home. So when you do find a place like this, hold it tight. Don't tell a bunch of people. Keep it to yourself and enjoy it kind of a theme throughout this episode but as herpers I believe we have a responsibility to take care of these animals and when you find a really special place like this where you can just find salamanders under everything people are going to want to know about it which is fine and great but when a bunch of people find out about a place like this people stop putting the logs back correctly people don't sanitize their gear and all of that eventually leads to a cascading effect which leads to direct detrimental effects for the animals. So in the creek habitat, there's only a handful of salamanders, at least here, that will be breeding there. So you have to learn what salamanders you want to find and what microhabitat they're going to be most likely to be found in. This spot is not a great example because there's just so many marbled salamanders here. But generally speaking, this type of stuff that we're in right now is more ideal microhabitat for marbled salamanders. They don't breed in wetlands that have fish, they breed in ephemeral wetlands. And an ephemeral wetland is a wetland that dries up seasonally. Remember that word because it's important for salamanders specifically. So this little area we're in right now is kind of a seasonal floodplain, which normally would be pretty full of water right now, but because it's a dry year, it's pretty dry. But if I were to turn over a log here, let's just take this one for example, there's going to be a lot of moisture underneath it. You can see tons of moisture, tons of bugs, really good microhabitat to potentially find a salamander. So tip number seven, research what salamander you want to see on any given day if you're in an area that has multiple species and do everything you can to make sure you are in the right microhabitat for that species. Here we have a nice little double flip. We've got our first slimy salamander of the day next to, I think, our fourth marbled, third or fourth marbled. This guy's missing his tail. Look at that. 
Salamanders are truly incredible in their regenerative abilities. They can regenerate not only their tails, but also their limbs and organs. Tip number eight, be able to recognize good logs. So what I mean by that is generally speaking, there's a certain type of log that salamanders like. And it's not these logs like this one that are just kind of floating. You can see this log on top of another log. If we turn this over, there's not really much contact with the earth and it's not very moist under there. There could always be a salamander under there, but I like our bets a lot more with these that are kind of embedded, covered in leaves and a little bit decayed. So when the log decays, the salamanders can actually burrow inside it. And it's a little bit better. Nobody under there. There we go. Marbled and a baby slimy. And a giant grub. Look at that thing. Check this one. All right. It exemplified my point quite well in that it's very easy to pick out which logs are most likely to have salamanders. They're going to be decayed. They're going to be embedded. They're going to have a nice moisture seal from lots of leaves and such. Look at how small this guy is. He is adorable. And there's another. This is actually a pretty small marble, too. Look at that. Here's another tip. Personally, I like to move everything out from under the log before I put it back, just to be safe and make sure we don't squish anybody. And then you can just kind of put them back in the leaf litter and they'll find their way under. But you can see what I mean when I flip this log, it kind of exposed this area right here. You just wanna tuck that back in so that the moisture seal stays as intact as possible. Look at this thing huge. Tip number 10 is another general herping tip. This whole episode is going to be more of a stream of consciousness than like a hard tip list. This is just things I'm thinking of as I go and things that are going through my head that I think should be going through your head if you want to have a productive salamandering expedition. And for tip number 10, just be aware of your surroundings. I get a lot of people complaining about me, you know, flipping things with my hands and not always wearing boots, not wearing snake boots. But at the end of the day, being aware of your surroundings is the best thing you can do to be safe. Just make sure there's no cotton mouths sitting along the logs when you're flipping them. And then you can use your hands without an issue. This one's kind of falling apart, so. And that doesn't just apply to venomous snakes. Be aware of other people. Be aware of things like hornet nests, you know. There's just a million things that could go wrong when you're in the forest by yourself and you want to be prepared to deal with those things. But yeah, just make sure you're doing everything you can to make sure you're aware of your surroundings and not putting yourself in potentially dangerous situations. Here's a good one for the be aware of your surroundings uh, subject. Right here we have a yellow jacket nest. It's not active because it's winter and I think it might have even been from like a couple years ago, but still. If you ever flip a log and see something like that, turn and run because they will not hesitate to light you up. And also always watch for just like flying insects. If you see a bunch of insects flying around a log, don't flip it. There's probably a hornet nest underneath it. I don't know about you guys, but flying stinging insects are kind of like my kryptonite. There's nothing that ruins my day more than getting stung by a wasp or a yellow jacket. This is kind of interesting. That is an abandoned clutch of marbled salamander eggs. They just kind of look like little balls of poop, but they're actually squishy if you touch them, which I don't recommend doing. But I touch these just to make sure that they're actually salamander eggs and not poop. But yeah, probably abandoned because of how dry it was prior to this rain we got last night. And even still, I mean, this is a vernal pool we're in right now and it's just dry. There's normally water here this time of year. This is a big log. I think there's a good chance. It's a nice little double flip. Tons of these guys today, as expected. Another tip, always carry water with you, or at least a bottle that you can use to fill with creek water, just so that you can keep your hands damp and uh, you can keep salamanders moist if you interact with them for more than a few seconds. This one looks pretty ideal. I had to put my phone down to record that one, but sure enough, there we go. 
I didn't even notice this guy first, but there is an upland chorus frog underneath this log. Nice little double flip. We got a chorus frog oh, and a marbled salamander right here together. So that's a good example there of how much seasonality can affect what you're finding because the pileated woodpecker. Love seeing those guys. But yeah, seasonality is important when looking for salamanders and amphibians in general because the cast of characters we see in mid-December is going to be a lot different from the cast of characters we would see in March. That leads into another good tip. Be persistent, but not too persistent because there's definitely a fine line between being persistent and being stubborn when it comes to looking for salamanders or really any herps because sometimes you're just simply not in the right spot. It's best to spend an hour or two looking, and if you're not seeing anything, then move on to a different area. But at the same time, you wanna make sure you're at least relatively thorough because you don't wanna miss an opportunity to find something really cool because you gave up too soon. So that's definitely more of a personal preference thing. At least for me, if I spend 30 minutes to an hour in an area and I'm not seeing anything, I get kind of frustrated. And I tend to move on from those areas that I'm just not seeing anything Another tip in regards to persistence, don't just hammer the same area over and over again. Try to hit it during different seasons, different weather patterns, because you never know when a certain weather pattern is going to make a spot particularly productive. If you find a spot and you hit it once and you don't see anything, don't get too frustrated. Try coming back in a different time of year or a different weather. Another thing to keep in mind when you're looking for salamanders is what kind of habitat you're in in regards to snakes because this area right here seems pretty ideal for mud snakes and king snakes both of which are a very good find in this area so i might have to revisit this little micro habitat during the spring to see what i can get into so yeah if you're actually into snakes which i'm assuming most people watching this are then uh just remember to keep your snake radar on while you're looking for salamanders because you never know what you're gonna find now that's weird. That appears to be a perfectly healthy eastern box turtle. Look at that. I talked in a recent episode about how I don't like seeing these guys in the winter because they're always unhealthy looking, but he appears to be fine. Well, that comes right back to what I was saying about uh, always being aware of what kind of habitat you're in because even though it is winter, it is fairly nice out here and you never know when you're gonna find a snake or a box turtle or anything else out and about. Really, really neat. Normally when we see unhealthy box turtles in the winter, they have big swollen spots on their head and their eyes are crusty. But this guy appears to be outwardly very healthy, so that's great to see. I consider that a big win for the day, so I'm just gonna leave that guy to it. Very nice, Eastern box turtle. Those are upland chorus frogs calling. Normally, they'll start calling after New Year's, but I guess all that rain got them going a little bit early. This is a small chorus. As we move into prime breeding season, they'll be a lot louder than that. Oh, here's a good one. Check this out. There is an actual redback redback. It's a good looking mander. I've, only, I've seen a couple more of these, but they've all been the same as the first one. This one is a lot prettier. Very nice. So today we spent most of the day in kind of a floodplain forest type environment where there's a lot of salamander habitat. And tomorrow we are going to focus more on an upland creek type microhabitat where there's just not as much in terms of actual salamander habitat. It's a little more specific. But here in this area, those are the main two microhabitats we have. We have like this kind of floodplain forest type stuff we're in today. And then we have more of like an upland creek scenario. So tomorrow I think I'm going to go out into that type of habitat and we're going to do a couple more tips to wrap up the video that are more focused on that microhabitat because things are definitely a little bit different there. I am going to start making my way out of the woods and I will see you guys in the morning. Good morning everyone. We are back out here today in a different area, slightly different microhabitat. This is more of an upland salamander habitat we're going to be exploring today. And basically what this means is there's a lot less water and a lot less ideal salamander habitat, so it'll be a little bit quicker to check. 
but it is quite a bit different than where we were yesterday. So the strategy for finding salamanders here is a little bit different. That being said, you can turn over just about anything in this type of forested habitat in the winter. Have a good chance of seeing a red back salamander, for example, I flipped this rock and found maybe the smallest red back I've ever seen. Look at that guy. He is absolutely minuscule. It's definitely not nearly as pleasant out here today as it was yesterday. It's windy and it definitely got below freezing last night. But with that being said, most of the salamanders we're gonna be targeting today live in moving water. So I don't think we'll have any issue with it having been too cold last night. Basically, I'm on top of this ridge it's a big rocky area here and we're gonna head down into that low-lying area right there where there should be a little bit of a seepage so this little micro habitat's a little bit interesting because all of this is pretty much rainwater runoff but when we haven't had a lot of rain there is still water here it's just really restricted to this little area right here because there's a spring somewhere right here and the water flows out from underneath this hillside and runs down there. In my experience, whenever you find a stream like this, the best place to look for salamanders is going to be where the water is coming out from underneath the earth. There's a lot of subterranean stuff going on where that water is coming out, underground springs, and that is great habitat for salamanders. Except for a little bit of the water coming from that area right there, this is largely all rain runoff. And uh, you can see here, this is a seepage. This water is coming from underground. And uh, if you look over here, there's another one. You can see this water is flowing out from the hillside rather than from just upstream. So my guess, if we go through this leaf litter here and flip these logs and rocks, there's a good chance we'll find some salamanders. So I'm gonna poke around right here and see what I can turn up. Another way you can tell that this is uh, rain runoff is it's cold. I mean, that is very, very cold water. And if we come over here and we feel the water coming out of here, it's actually warm. Like it feels warm to the touch, almost like bath water. And that is a big part of why you can find salamanders in this type of habitat any time of the year, because this water comes from underground, it's constantly moving and it's warm, at least compared to the air and this really cold runoff. Another way you can tell this is just rain runoff rather than like a creek or a seepage. It's just got grass growing in it. This is normally dry. All right, so we're in this mucky part of the seepage that kind of feeds into the creek. Got a nice log here and underneath it was this guy. This is Desmognathus sp. I'm not exactly sure what species is here. It's either Conanti or Apalachicole. I'm leaning Apalachicole, honestly, because of just how long and spindly that tail is. And frankly, we could have both here, but I would definitely lean Apalachicole with this guy. Very interesting. But the Desmognathus group is one of those salamanders that is found primarily in this type of microhabitat, any sort of seepages or creeks, you tend to get Desmogs. So we'll probably see more of these today. So I've been here like probably at least 30 minutes now, and I have seen exactly one salamander. It's a good example of what I was talking about yesterday when I said some areas are just more salamander heavy than others. This is one of those places that it can be hard to find any salamanders. So I kind of think part of the reason that this spot seems to not have that many salamanders is because there's just not that much to flip in a lot of this creek. You can see in the water, there's a lot of very smallish rocks and uh, you can't always flip the rocks in the water, but a lot of times it's hard to see because there's always murk. And there will be salamanders under them. It's just a lot harder to actually get hands on them and get a look at them. So definitely if you're going to try to flip salamanders in a seepage or a creek type habitat, look for one that has a lot of stuff to actually flip. Because if you can't find much to flip, it's very hard to find salamanders in this habitat unless you come out here at night and shine around. All right, everyone, so here's a larger creek in this same area. Uh, we're not far at all from where we just, oh, a woodcock. That's cool. I don't get to see those too often, but usually when I do, they're here. The reason I came over to this larger creek is you can use creeks like this as a way to find seepages. You just walk them and keep an eye on the edges because a lot of times the seepages will feed out from under the hillside and into the bigger creek. 
also underneath this one little log right here, I was able to find our next dusky salamander. This one has a little bit more pattern on him. Doesn't just look like a black salamander, so I guess it's a little more interesting. All right, so here we have kind of a mucky seepage area. This is definitely more of a Shrek swamp type beat than that stuff we were in earlier, that nice, clean, clear seepage. But both seepages, nonetheless, because this is all groundwater that's coming out from underneath this hillside and feeding into the creek, which is over there. Definitely liking the look of this area. We got some nice logs that are kind of in the mud, but not necessarily underwater. So if there is something under them, we'll actually see it. Like I just flipped that one right there and it is pretty much mostly in the water. So I believe we're at tip number 17. Flip logs you'll actually be able to see under because you're flipping logs that are just super mucky, but you're not being able to see what's actually under them. There's a crayfish. It's not very helpful if you can't tell what you're flipping. Look at this guy. If you're in an area and you're seeing crayfish under logs, it's probably a pretty good sign because they're indicators of a healthy ecosystem and salamanders love to use their burrows. So crayfish are a good thing to see. So once again, I kind of want to emphasize that even though we didn't see a lot of salamanders here today, it doesn't necessarily mean there's not a lot of salamanders here. They're probably one of the most common vertebrates in this ecosystem, but there's just not a ton of places where they're accessible because there's not a ton to flip here. So the few places that we did find stuff to flip, we saw a couple salamanders and those are usually the same areas that I see salamanders. Tip number 19, think outside the box. Whenever you have a habitat like this that you might not be able to find salamanders in flipping, you can always try coming back at night on a rainy night and shining around and looking for them because they'll be everywhere. When it rains at night, salamanders come out of their burrows and walk around, look for food, look for mates, and just hang out. But yeah, I think I'm going to be wrapping up here shortly. I haven't uh, haven't seen too much today. Definitely hasn't been as productive as yesterday. But that's kind of the point. I wanted to show you guys that there's not necessarily going to be a million salamanders at every spot you go to. It kind of builds more of an appreciation for those places that do have a ton of salamanders because they are truly special. That being said, it was not a bad outing. We saw a couple of desmogs and that American woodcock was really cool. It's not a bird I get to see very often. And that's a good last tip to end on. Enjoy the little things. Even though we might not have seen exactly what we were hoping to see, which for me was at least a spring salamander or a red salamander, it's still a decent day. It's always nice to be outdoors. And life isn't only about seeing snakes and salamanders. It's always cool to see all the other wildlife, learn about it, and just enjoy being in the woods. Looking for salamanders for me, it's a very peaceful and meditative thing because it's often just me by myself in the woods enjoying the peace and quiet. And for me, that's what it's all about. So you're not always going to find your target species and that's okay. So I think on that note, I'm going to wrap this up. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hopefully a lot of the newer herpers watching this or just people who are interested in starting herping learned a thing or two. And for the more seasoned herpers, hopefully you all picked up a thing or two as well. I know I'm pretty constantly learning new things still, even though I've been doing this my whole life. That being said, it's possible this is going to be the last vlog of 2022, unless the weather changes for the better. I would love to get out a couple more times, but the weather is just going to be so bad over the next couple weeks. I'm talking highs, not even getting above freezing. So if I don't see you guys again before the new year, happy holidays. And I'm looking forward to starting this up again in 2023. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.